Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So um, this, uh, this talk will be presented by the team from G2 Microsystem, and uh, John is the CEO, uh, founder and CEO of the company, and uh, he's actually accompanied by uh, three very capable uh, people, Lisa, um, I don't know exactly what you do, but uh, he knows Gordon Bell for... We for, wonder about that too sometimes, <laughs> but she does a lot. Uh, she knows uh, Gordon Bell for about 20 years, and, uh, and then... Uh, Peter and uh, Jason, um, they, are, they are both uh, technical uh, leads uh, with the company. So I don't know how exactly they're going to do this presentation, but uh, they're going to actually tell us a bit about uh, their technology, which is a what they call the ultra-low-power Wi-Fi tax that can be used for a variety of tracking, inventory management, tracking, and location uh, apps. And, uh, and I also want to uh, add that uh, this talk, the material that's covered in this talk, is not under NDA, and that's why we were just sorting this out before we get the talk started, so just so you know. Um, even though that uh, John's company does have an NDA with a specific product group, but this talk will not be covered under NDA. So with that, I'll have a John start. Thank you very much. Thank uh, I hope to make this more of an interactive conversation than just us sitting up here talking. What we'd like to do is quickly go over G2 and, and what we've developed here. We've announced the product as of last Monday and have it out to customers with evaluation. I'll start over then. <laughs> oh, that's loud. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate you being here. We hope to make this an interactive conversation, uh, one which we're going to talk about the chip. And what we'd like to you know, get feedback from you on is you know, what applications what, what issues do you see? How does that compare to other technologies we're interested in? Because what we found is, is that we originally targeted a particular set of markets. And what we're finding is, is that the use that other people want to use this technology for, this product for, is way beyond what we originally anticipated. And I'm sure from uh, your perspectives and, and visions that you see, it, we'd love to hear back from you of where you see it and how it compares to, say, other technologies in the space. But let me get into it real quick. G2's been around for two years. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go through the market that we're targeting because I think that sets the context of what we're trying to do. We're not trying to be everything to everyone. We're actually trying to solve specific problems. But what we found is about two and a half years ago, we went and talked to a lot of end users, companies like Boeing, Genentech, and others to say, what are your problems? And what we were trying to identify is, were there opportunities for products that instead of having high bandwidth, high power capabilities, actually had low bandwidth low power capabilities. You know, so everyone was targeting off at you know, 54 megabits per second and high, high power and N. And it's like the question is, is, yeah, but what about the low end? We thought there might be that market opportunity there. We went out and talked to all these companies. And there were three key things that really traded off, whether you're talking Wi-Fi, whether you're talking Zigbee or Bluetooth or the others. The three major parameters everyone talked about was total cost of ownership. How much does it cost for me to really install the overall solution? Not just the reader or the tag, which is what all the press is about, but also the back office integration, the application, the pulling of the cables. When people who have really done that, they go, oh my god, this is so expensive today. So one of the reasons in our, our, when, we, when we really saw that, we said, well, you know, Zigbee, which we were considering, is like, wow, I have to put in a whole new network to do this. That's going to be a real inhibitor, not only to maybe the value prop that's there, but also the fact that I can't do a pilot. That is, most people who do pilots have a half a million dollars to spend. And what happens is, is if you look at like passive RFID, to do a passive RFID or proprietary RFID reader infrastructure will cost you millions of dollars just to do the pilot because you've got to pull the cables, set up the readers, do the back office integration to see if you get the value. And most companies can't afford that. So total cost of ownership was a real driving factor across the board. The second was you needed ultra low power, which no Wi-Fi device had today. We're talking orders of magnitude, like 200 to 500 X. What was out there today had to be lower power. You need battery lives of like two AA's that last four to five years. It couldn't be months. 
It had to be years. And the third was there was a high degree of functionality people wanted to use. They actually wanted like a computer on the net. It wasn't just I want 128 bits or I want some little piece. There was a lot of functionality and people wanted to use it in different ways. I'll quickly just give you an example of the markets. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but these were the markets that were identified by a number of analysts. We've all heard about asset tracking here. The RTLS, the global locate market is I want to track something throughout the world anywhere. And if you really think about it, there's only one frequency you can do that at today, which is 2.4 gigahertz, which is regulated worldwide. There's others around industrial wireless. So this is process monitoring or uh, data logging or other types of uh, management that you want to use. And then there's commercial wireless, like meter reading at homes. Also, uh, there was uh, within the home area in residential wireless, there's also things like uh, talking to uh, Abbott Labs about glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring on a patient. They had used it with Bluetooth, but they realized they couldn't ship the data anywhere. And most hospitals didn't have Bluetooth, and no one at home had Bluetooth. So it was great that they had it, and the concept was great, but the infrastructure and the rest of the solution stack wasn't there to really make it happen. And what we saw is that there was, our premise two years ago was Wi-Fi was going to become ubiquitous that it would be everywhere. And therefore, could you leverage that network and could you achieve those requirements that people had? Those are just some of the applications that we identified talking to customers about that were really important to them to solve problems because that's where we see technology really taking off is can I solve a problem and can I get an ROI, which we all know. But there, the amazing part was it was just, as you see, it wasn't just one area that you had to solve, but the opportunity for low data rate and long battery life had a number of applications across multiple industries that could really solve significant problems to companies today. What the overall solution looks like, therefore, is one, as we talked about, part of the reason that maybe Bluetooth or others aren't taking off yet is you have to have the entire stack. So that means you have to have the application, you have to have the the database, you have to have the infrastructure to communicate the information and all the protocols that are there. And we found people were concerned with security protocols in some instances and in other instances they weren't. But what our solution looks like, no matter whether you're doing telemetry or asset tracking or anything else, is a very low cost MRM device that has very long battery life typically on the order of one to four years where you're reporting maybe every 40 seconds, every minute. It's not that you're constantly on trying to talk. You're reporting data and communicating on a, on a one-way basis, pushing data out. So process monitoring is like that versus process control is slightly different. And that you needed the infrastructure that sent it to the location-based server. Now the greatest neat feature of 802.11, it's got all that overhead in there that sucks a lot of power at times, but the real thing is 802.11 doesn't require any back office integration. We built the tag so it has the URL in the tag, and so you have no back office. You can send it anywhere in the world. So you can have this facility here, and if your server's way over in China, once it gets the internet connection, it sends it over. There's no back office, and that's the real inhibitor to many applications today is, yeah, it goes here into this, but then I've got to download into a batch somewhere in the world today. That's too time consuming and the data translation is too much. If you're able to use a URL and packet the data as an EDI format, XML format, or anything else, there's, it's completely transparent to the user in this facility. You don't require process change, and you don't require a whole bunch of data changes. So you're, I guess I'm a little confused. So it's, it's a HTTP server host or it's a client that you get a DHCP address to connect to a server someplace? It's a client. So it's assuming a DHCP assignable address? We'll, we'll get into that if you just hold that off and, and we can get into that a little bit more. But that's the overall stack and that's what we put together for it. You can see it has an incredible amount of functionality on it because in some cases you need that functionality, in a lot of cases you don't. What we find is people say, I want 802.11i, then when they start seeing how much it costs them in power and overhead, they sit there and quickly go to, well, I might just need some open authentication protocols. So it's really interesting, but you have to cover it all to really make it happen. 
The stack that we have, the very first market we went after was asset tracking within a facility, which was key, uh, really area. And part of the reason is, is the entire stack was there already. That is, there are software providers, there are location engine providers, there's the infrastructure that's already there, and then there's the actual tag itself and the chip. The difference we saw is right now, all of these players in this spot were actually like in the old days of computers, they were building it all from off-the-shelf parts that weren't designed for low power. And so what we did is decided that we could target this and develop not only the chip, but the actual firmware to relieve uh, all the protocols and everything else. We developed the firmware and the chip to really provide a complete functioning system to someone who actually needs a very low power device. Question. Well, the fiber one is a chip, but it's 80 by 50 by millimeter by some millimeter, which is a very big chip to me. It looks like it's a whole package of total chip. It's a big chip. Yeah. Uh, you have to have a big chip for if you're talking 802.11 radio on it. Are we, are we getting confused over what's a chip and what's a tag? Yeah. Uh, 80 plus 50 millimeters. Oh, case. that's that's the tag itself. I'm sorry. So, so yes. Uh, this back here is definitely not the chip. This is the tag, and that's all driven actually by battery. Uh, more than anything else, do you want to use a coin cell battery? Do you want to use a slim outline? This is a slim outline because one of the areas was personnel tracking. Uh, one of the classic examples is this is a research facility, right? As visitors come in, you might want to use passive to allow people in and out of exiting, but you actually want to track your visitors real time to make sure they're not going into certain zones of of it and where they've been. And that would be a classic example. There's others though, around refineries and others that you want to track real time rather than just in a zone method. So I'll let Jason take over and really talk about the chip and what it does. Thanks very much, John. Uh, is that on? Is that on? Yep, good. Okay, so I actually work with the engineering team down in uh, Sydney. Um, and so I guess my background is um, Jason, my digital, um, the mic's not on. We can hear you though. There we go. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, there we go. Thought I flicked it. So yeah, I um, work with the engineering team uh, down in Sydney, um, primarily uh, with the digital guys, although I've had a, a lot of um, exposure kind of right across the whole chip uh, and the development of the chip. And this is a really, really exciting chip to work with, I've got to say. Um, when we were kind of um, trying to work out just what the hell to build, we went out and talked to lots and lots of customers and you know, they came back with lots of different um, applications um, that required a lot of different technologies. And we ummed and ahed and thought, well, you know, do we take this, do we take that? And, and kind of at the end of the day, we thought, look, let's just try and put as much as we possibly can in there um, with a, you know, a CPU and to enable you know, lots of different applications in lots of different markets. So uh, I'm just going to run, kind of run over the functionality that's in the chip. So um, off on the left hand side over there, um, there is essentially a, a sensor interface for um, interfacing to lots of different sensors such as you know, temperature, humidity, shock, uh, security seals, pressure, motion, um, and you know, that, that's real time sensing. Um, and so we have some signal processing that's monitoring um, these inputs and you can set thresholds and whatever. You can wake the chip up and you know, go and do whatever it needs to do um, once it you know, hits those thresholds. So um, we also have um, RFID um, and, and you know, the EPC, electronic product code um, reader in there, sorry the standard in there. We have a, an ISO or the soon to be ratified uh, ISO 24730-2 standard which is uh, essentially 125 kilohertz magnetic receiver. Um, for uh, new field communications. Um, and so that's kind of on a low the low power side of the chip. Um, and in the higher power domains, we've got um, a 32 bit Spark CPU, um, which um, is kind of running off um, you know, 80K RAM and 320K ROM. Um, now, this, in the higher power states, the CPU is, um, can control pretty much every section of the chip. Uh, and so it can, it can kind of, for instance, go and set the, um, the 802.11 up to receive, um, you know, uh, packets or synchronize the beacons or authenticate back to a, um, to a network. And, and it, whilst, say, the, um, the receiver is going to sit in a lot, 
in, in the kind of receive mode, the CPU can go into a doze state to, you know, to save some power. So there's, I guess, you know, a complete 802.11 solution on here. I mean, essentially, this is no different to a, you know, an 802.11b client card um, in, in the sense that you know, full transmit, full receive, complete you know, sensitivity down to minus 94 dBm, um, transmit power out to you know, um, kind of about 15, I believe it is, dBm. Um, and so what else have we got in here? Um, off, off on the right-hand side, um, we have uh, essentially an interface out to um, you know, serial interface to flash memory. So you can um, you know, store information or programs on the flash memory, boot, uh, boot up and you know, load an app from memory. Um, we have 10 general purpose IOs um, on the chip. So um, you know, in an application, I guess, you, know, you hit a temperature threshold, wake up, do something, turn something on, turn something off, whatever, go back to sleep. Um, so there's, there's like there's so many different um, applications for um, for this kind of chip because you know with with the, the enabling technology in there and under CPU control which can get right down buried down into each of the little blocks you know I guess the um, what you do with it is really limited by your imagination and so you know I guess one of the reasons we came here today was kind of to talk to you guys about you know, what do you possibly think, you know, we could do with this, um, with this kind of chip? And so, you know, we, we provide, um, I guess, a, a software platform that makes it very easy also to program. Um, so we're not kind of throwing you to the walls and saying, well, you know, go in and, and kind of bit bash registers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we've kind of built, a, you know, a complete um, API um, around, um, you know, all of the, the technology on here that, that really makes it simple for customers to, to develop very quickly uh, applications um, you know, around the technology in the chip here. So you know, for instance, one of the customers we've worked with can, uh, you know, kind of manage to, within about a week, uh, program you know, the chip to kind of do RSSI measurements and send the information back um, via you know, uh, association and authentication back to um, you know, a, a network and to their kind of proprietary software. So I guess the message here is there's so many, so many different kind of uh, bits of technology and uh, what you do with it is, you know, is only limited by your imagination. So the CPU, uh, what's the cost rate for that? 44 megahertz. 44 megahertz, is it 32-bit? Correct. Yeah, earlier you said that uh, you had the sensor interface where you can actually do some uh, signal processing. Yes. Is it a separate processor that does that, or does it actually run so on the same CPU? There's, um, there's some hard-coded um, signal process processing in um, in this part of the chip here for um, for things like uh, I guess it's shock and uh, what are the, what are the other things that we've got? Security signals, motion sensor. Security motion sensor. Yep. Yeah, but mostly to make a measurement, the, the way it works is you determine you need to make a measurement with the always on block. You wait, you, look, uh, you wait the, the um, 133 section, which actually contains the sample measurement unit, which is the A to Ds, which makes the measurements, and then you shut down again. If you're doing something like temperature, that's what you're doing. Well, where's the heat unit? In the sample measurement unit here. Ah, okay. So the thing like, you know, if you're running it as a shock sensor, what happens is that you connect the, the sensor elements up to, up to here. The device, when you drop it, it um, starts digitizing the acceleration values. Meanwhile, it wakes the CPU. The buffer is deep enough that it can get the CPU awake. Uh, before it misses any data, the CPU handles the data and it shuts down. So, so, so this, uh, this always on module on the left most is the one that actually does the sensing and the digitization. And all right. weeks up that the main module is necessary. Yeah, so the main, main module programs, are, you know, thresholds and, and whatever, um, and, you know, sets up all the muxing so that, you, you know, when you're actually kind of sampling, because um, there's actually eight. Um, analog uh, sensor inputs off on, off on the side. I assume that, that this sensor could also sense radio such that they can wake on the radio. Yes, yeah, wake particularly, up. particularly um, like EPC, right. so you can wake the tag up when it um, goes through an EPC reader that treats it in a certain way, that kind of thing. Question about the uh, two blocks, those you always own and the yep. 
the middle block. You, down the bottom, you're showing a, a sample measurement unit in the not always on part. Yeah. I'm kind of confused about what it does and how it's distinguished from what's over on the left. Yeah, that's that's a good a good a good I am not about the way to draw that. That's actually where it physically is. In early measures something such as temperature. Such as temperature with this away. You can measure with this not away. You can measure you can monitor for acceleration, start digitizing shock batteries, um, do security seals, you know, motion detector, detect the readers, and magnetic signals. Now, you want to take something such as a temperature measurement, and because of the, um, the power architecture of the chip, then we can start to make that measurement at a very high level. So basically, you have different classes of measurement. Different classes. Yeah, okay. So, so, so basically, the leftmost one is the trigger type of sensing. Yes. Yes. Whereas the other one is the waveform sensing. Yes. Correct. So if I want to do FFT, Presumably, I could either send this out or have the CPU does that. And I don't know if the CPU is capable enough to do city on FFT. Really? Well, so, uh, it's, 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 so, I'm sorry, what data right? Um, well, it depends on what sensor they are dealing with, say, acoustic sensors. You could probably, probably do it. I mean, you, you're going to get potentially limited by, you know, if you're going to start writing really large applications, you're going to run out of RAM. Right. Yeah, so you can deal with the, uh, Radio, right? The CPU is taking care of the radio. If they're on at the same time, yeah. We the, the model we tend to work with is the models where the we switch them on one at a time. So the CPU does some work, pushes the data across to the radio, and says send this, and sits in a low power wave state. Um, radio deals with it, wakes the CPU back up again. Fairly simple applications. Like processing audio and in real time, you know, digitizing it pumping it through the processor and shipping it out as Wi-Fi, I guess is we kind of contemplate that side so to think about it overnight. When I think of the CPU, should I think uh, uh, R or should I think 80 or 8 or something in the middle? Sorry, look, the CPU. The CPU, is it a, a decent risk chip or is it one of the, or it's an old 80 or 8 or not? No, 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 it's a 32-bit Spark. Okay. Uh, V8, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty chunky processor. Yeah. So the new chip is it a single IC or is it a Indeed, it's a single IC. Yep, which um, I think we've got, we've actually got a, a sample tag kind of uh, around here. So the, um, yeah, I, I guess how, the chip's actually, uh, what, it's a 72 pin uh, package. Um, yep, QFP. Sorry. It's maybe a non-issue, but the Spark at Vestano is only the engine, which means a lot of Microsoft software will simply break on it. Okay, so um, in the um, so what we have built into the ROM is ECOS, which is an embedded, configurable operating system. So you know, it's very difficult to just go and port um, uh, you know software or operating systems or whatever um, into su such a tiny little device. You've got to be very, very careful about what you're putting in there because you know, one of the, the key goals here is power. So if you're not very careful, you'll, you know, you'll burn a battery in no time, right? So you really need to be um, thinking hard about, you know, exactly what you're putting in there and how many cycles it kind of needs to, to do stuff. So um, we've, we've got buried, buried in, the, um, in the ROM um, an embedded um, operating system, which, by the way, you actually don't have to use, but um, you know, for Ada 2.11 you'd need to use it because it's a multi-threaded um, operating system. We have a, a security library, um, which actually I didn't didn't discuss that. If you just pop pop back to the to the last yep, slide, uh, yeah, this guy. So um, I'm not even sure that's shown on there. Where's the crypto? There it is, cryptography accelerator. So that crypto accelerator um, is we have a, a hardware 128-bit AES. Um, RC4, um, MD5, SOJ1, and TKIP MIC. So TKIP, um, which is an 802.11 security, no, TKIP MIC, actually, MIC is the, the actual message integrity check, um, and it's a, it's a hardware um, yeah, check, uh, which is kind of post added to web, essentially to try and improve security. Uh, so, you know, there's 
we've kind of built in um, you know, all of this security um, uh, architecture to try and really kind of fit into the, you know, the 802.11 world. And you know, how that's used is really up to the application developer. Um, and, and by the way, you can actually get in and use each of the individual blocks um, for you know, purposes other than just, say, 802.11. Again, uh, uh, another downer. Yeah. My note has a senior MD5 killer and a junior MD5 killer on its staff. What do the rules and breaks in MD5 and the later in shot? Right. Um, well, this so th this just has the standard MD5 algorithm in it, but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, if it, if that's deemed as not being you know secure enough, then you know you would use you know an AES um, hash or something like that. Um, maybe I just want to pop back to the software, maybe. Um, so yes, we have uh, 80 kilobytes of RAM, um, which uh, has some some of that obviously needs to be reserved for stacks and, and whatever um, for you know the operating system to, to kind of use. But there's between uh, between about 30 to 50 k of um, application space available, the application developer. Um, so you know we have the ability to load, you know, boot the operating system, load out. Um, an application from the flash into the into the chip, do some execution, and then you know, if you're running out of space, you, have, you can write like a, a little mini app, for instance, where you could then go go back out and pull in another app. So you know, 802.11 full security is is going to you know potentially shoot lots and lots of um, space, but you don't need all of that functionality loaded in, you know at any one particular time. So you could, for instance, kind of load up um, the the part of the app that goes and kind of authenticates and etc cetera, etc cetera, and then you just don't need that stuff anymore because you're authenticated. So you, then you load in whatever other part of the um, you know the application that you need to use. Um, it, you know if if the RAM became um, a problem. But in, I think under general general circumstances and for most of the applications that um, we're seeing, you don't you know it's you're going to have trouble kind of running over the top of there. But it, you have to kind of change your thinking a little bit because you know, you don't have megabytes of memory here. You can't just write kind of bloatware. You've really got to be a bit careful about how you actually kind of you know design the, the apps. I'm in a group. We're, we're putting web services on devices, so we have the, the SOAP and XML parsers and the web services stack. It takes about 100k. Uh -huh. This does it have IP or IP or is that so built built into? Um, uh, this guy is, um, I think we can do TCP, IP, UDP, DHCP. Um, I mean, the LWIP is a lightweight IP. IP, IP stack. Yep. So it's got all the basics. LWIP, oh. LWIP lightweight yeah. IP. So if we wanted to put that other stuff on top, it might fit in the RAM, or if it didn't, you yep. have the three megabit, megabyte. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But again, you have to be. If we kind of always thinking, how much battery is this using? How much of the power on the chip? Is, you know, if I'm running stuff a lot, you know, and I've got the, the you know the center of the chip awake a lot, you're going to flatten your battery pretty quickly. So it's a bit of a shift in thinking. You know, don't just stay up, do everything you can do, and kind of hang around. You've got to, you really got to kind of sit down and plan your application um, to really suit, you know, the um, I guess the, you know, the real world application. You know. If you if you Need to add memory. The three megabyte add-on does that change the the battery life dramatically? The, the flash, you mean? The serial flash? Well, no, no, no it doesn't. No. no, if you added extra spy devices, it wouldn't affect the uh, no, battery life at all. Because they're powered up only when the the CPU is powered up. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. So you know, three to eleven um, to uh, to try and. You know, use some of the power saving features of 802.11 is obviously something you would try to do. So, you know, we're supporting the power save pole modes for 802.11, uh, where you, you know, you wake up, you authenticate, you tell the, the access point that, hey, I'm a power saving device, buffer pa packets for me, I'll check back in, you know, a minute's time or something like that, and then you go to sleep. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Fundamental question that, that it's a very appealing device. In fact, this would, the economy of this device makes it appealing for a mains powered sensor. In yeah. In this case, power savings has no Correct. bearing on it, and it'd be really nice if there were sort of two modes: large memory mode, small memory mode. 
Is that? Can you accommodate that? Uh, we would. I would say on the next product, we're looking at that. Uh, just the memory is not a big. It's just the cost. It's a big divide. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And we chose this for reasons that most of the things we were looking at were low data rates, where you don't need a lot of memory. And you're not trying to do a whole lot of calculations or algorithm running. Uh, but we we would love feedback to say where where are the requirements such as yours of you know it could be used in this area but you would need this because we're right now we mostly say when you really look at and start going through it's 80 k is quite a bit because everything else is taken care of for you so about that 80 k you get 50 k language yeah about that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we're finding most but. There will be some that are larger, and probably our next chip will have more. Uh, our game plan is twofold. One is to go up in functionality, such as more memory, adding GPS. The other is to go down in cost and drop off functionality as people are more well-defined of what the application is they're running, uh, because that's the real challenge. People get this and go, wow, this is, I, there's so much I could do with this, I'm not sure yet. It's like, okay. Both. One, one of the apps that we're looking at is, is for home control for home health monitoring devices to connect them to some PC or aggregator device and send the information, you know, across the internet. Somebody cares and stuff. And so some of our partners are building uh, little dongles for legacy devices. So you've got a, a digital uh, light control system yep. with a serial. Like every, they're still building brand new products with serial ports on. Mm -hmm. Crazy for cereal, but yeah. that's why. Yeah. But, but so he built it on here. They've got a little thing that's like it plugs into the cereal port. And it talks Wi Fi at the other side. And, it's, and it converts the cereal API to that device to a, a web service. It exposes it to a web service and converts it to Wi Fi. So you can take one of those devices, just plug a dongle on it, bang, your PC or thing discovers it, and you can have the normal relationship with it. So those, those things are like, I don't know. It's giving the price of that dongle down, the cheaper the better, the smaller, the lower power. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's exactly the kind of application that we've targeted this product at. Uh -huh. And what we've, you know, the, the, the kind of architecture that we have in mind is something where the chip wakes up, makes a measurement of whatever it is, whatever it is right. assembles a packet that you know, associates with a network, like WEP is on there. You know, most, a lot of homes are using WEP, but if people are using the higher ones, we support some of those as well. So the tags on the network basically takes the data, assembles it into maybe a UDP packet, maybe ships it to the PC on the network, or ships it out of, the, out of it, but in a very, where the data, the payload is actually very simply encoded and let the guy at the other end, you know, actually work work out what it means and what right. it was. So how do you get the web key? There's no UI for this. So um, there's, uh, there's this, the two kilobytes of NVRAM um, uh, built into the chip that you can you can program at, uh, I guess, uh, at factory. You can program keys into into that NVRAM, and while the battery is connected, that those keys. Um, kind of exist, and you know that's a that's a great kind of security. Um, uh, well, yeah, it's great for security because you know the keys aren't kind of coming in and out of, of the pins of the chip. Well, that's that's yeah. one one, right? So in other words, I have a in the home health environment, I have a scale manufacturer who puts the web key in, so the consumer has to change their web key on on their there, router. There's there's two there's two ways I could see of doing that. Yeah. And we have another manufacturer's different yeah, yeah. web key. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two two ways I could see of doing that. The chip's got a serial interface, right? So you could actually connect it serially. You know, you could if you had a, a tag with some pins in it, you could actually set it up and do it that way with an application running on your PC. Another way you could do it is to um, to ship the chip with uh, uh, open authentication, so that you actually have to initially set your home network up to, um, to you know, the same way as you set up your access point, security on your access point, log into your chip, change the keys, and then bang, the chip's over. But I think probably the serial, serial. approach would be the yeah. better of those two. I don't know, what would you, would you think that would work? We have different ways of doing it. We have this, this flash config thing that we're, sh we're shipping in, uh, well, we're shipping right now, actually. And you can um, think the device can say hello on the network, the PC discovers it, 
the, the, the device has a serial number on the bottom of it, a little pin number. Yeah. You type that in, and then and you, because your, net, your neighbor on the other side of the wall can see the same hello message, right? It's only the person who can visually see it. Mm -hmm. They put in the pin number, and then the PC transfers the, the code to it. Yeah. Or you, you can get a flash, a USB flash, and stick it in your PC that has the code, and you stick it in the device, and it transfers in that way, too. But, I mean, you're not going to have a, you don't want to have a USB part of the thing. That way with the pin number, I think, is the way to a way to do it. Or for cameras, what we do is we actually plug a cable into it and boot it up and it switches the key that you unplug it. It's wireless, for wireless cameras, for Wi-Fi cameras. The other scenario we have is, uh, you know, say in the fitness environment, you're walking down to the pro club, they've got about 200 elliptical machines sitting in there. All right, so we, you know, we want to have an employee go in, they have them capture their workout on that particular mm -hmm. machine. Um, so if I have my, my cell phone that's got Wi-Fi stack in there, I should be able to do that, be able to pair with that individual device easily. Um, so I, I agree with Jack. It, you know, it would be great if you had some sort of. of uh, but it seems to me you need to have a higher level stack sitting up there that talks to your device that you know that you can have it program the web stack on there yeah. and you can talk to. I mean, it's coming in Wi-Fi, it intercepts it, and says you know. Even if the data gets input some way or hits a database somewhere, a web service that knows that particular treadmill number E7 is this particular code, not really for security, but just again for that one one pairing. So, are there any more kind of questions here around the chip or? Yeah, yeah ROM reprogrammable, say, to the data? No. This, this ROM is um, kind of burned, burned into silicon. Yep. So. Our next generation will have a one-time program where we'll run one. Because someone won't, may want to change the system. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the challenge we have is just there's so many markets emerging when you start to get into this space. Uh, and some applications are going to fit. I mean, we really focused on power here. Uh, not, you know. Roughly, what's your cost on this? Is it under 100 bucks a unit? Oh. We're targeting tags, the MRM devices. We're not manufacturing, but other people are. Uh, you know, starting out right now, twenty dollars. Uh, we ultimately believe our roadmap can take us down to five. That's great. So. Can you be the, the modules you pass around? Correct. Yeah. You have the battery. I mean, what drives it will become the battery cost and what so you choose. The market out there today for Bluetooth serial to Bluetooth is about. 70 bucks, so I guess you get down to about 50 if you buy volume and stuff, but it's still pretty expensive. Yeah. Well, so, Don, was we're working with every 30, 40 bucks. But that's yeah. Ethernet. To go with Wi Fi, it's like one milliamp, I guess. Or, no, so, we're, we'll be waiving for that, though. Right, right. This that's great. Be be bad. Yeah, I mean, what we're, we realize that. We're not trying to. Better. I mean, we're coming out trying to be very aggressive on our pricing. Where's the point? I don't know. <laughs> because we think the markets will open up. Uh, at twenty dollars. You said earlier when you opened this up, saying that you actually trade the bandwidth, the data rate, it's the battery, uh, yeah, the battery life. Can you actually give us a sense of that trade-off? In other words, uh, what regime you're talking about, like the data rate, what we think of some, how it is, and is that way to adjust us? Can you have I mean, I mean, you know, a lot of what I had have to say, unfortunately, is the. Cut off, but I can just talk about that in general, sticking around things, pieces of information that are in the public domain. If you think about Zigbee, which is widely touted as a great thing for doing sensor networks, right? If you're looking at transmit powers of the order of, you know, 50 milliwatts. That's at zero dBm, maybe 100 milliwatts. Those kind of numbers. Right? 20, 30 at zero dBm. Right, it's just fairly short range of their ADV. But if you look at, um, and it's running at 250 kilobits a second, right, in that, that kind of mode. So if you compare that with 802.11, you know, you can run an 802.11 um, at 11 megabits. And, you know, in a transmit mode, you might be using a watt. So, so if you actually look at what's important, which is the energy per bit, and do the math, the 802.11 is lower. Because right, you've got to switch a, up, you've got switch a, up. Yeah, so, so basically what you have to do 
in order to build an 802.11 solution which is competitive with Zigbee is to think very carefully about how you do it and the chip architecture, etc. But there's no fundamental reason. If you look at it as a straight a matter of a matter of physics, there's no fundamental reason. When you look at the receive side of it, right, the uh, difference between an 802.11 receiver and a Zigbee receiver is nowhere near 40 to 1. Yet the data rate is again 40 to 1 different. You look at an 802.11 network, like this building, I'm sure you have complete wireless coverage in here. The network's already there. Um, so, so with an eight, so whereas in a Zigbee system, people talk about, you know, hops having to hop. So when you think about that, the hopping. So you, on 802.11, you're already comparable or lower per bit on uh, on on energy, and everything's one hop. You know, you just talk straight to a powered device. You've got complete coverage. So the infrastructure. That, everything I've told you is in the public right. domain. You've just got to put the pieces together. And we've basically done that and put the pieces together in a chip that's architected for battery operation. So, so basically what you're saying is that uh, the way you set power is to carefully schedule the on and off of the mm -hmm. main board and yep. the radio chip. You're not actually trying to cut down the current. Is that here. No, that's that's how you get you know defeat the laws of physics. You can't really do that. And to design applications and systems that don't have much data to send. Right? Like if you're doing temperature monitoring, I mean, how many you know how much data have you actually got to send? Not you know once a minute. Send six you know pay you know a bit ahead of stuff. You might be sending 16 bits if you're lucky. Yeah. But of it, data. It has a wake up feature. Something event happens. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got, we've, you know, all of the wake up features and the power management and the way we handle the radios, that's that's our secret sauce. Yep. Right? And we basically got it got it down. But, you know, you could use, for instance, for tracking people around buildings, you put a um, a ball in tube kind of sensor on the uh, on the tag and you know, you can tell that the, the person's moving because the, the ball's kind of moving backwards and forwards, right? And so in that instance, you could program the chip to wake up, you know, and every 15 or 40 seconds or, or whatever it is, um, report back the, the you know the new location via some kind of um, you know either RSSI locate or a, um, a TDOA locate. Um, but you know, you could also program it so that if the the person is no longer moving, then you you know you kind of pull out the time that you report back. And so you'll save power that way. So you ain't, you're measuring the environment around you to work out how to how to use power most efficiently. I think what we're seeing too quite a bit uh, is this low data rate market is emerging. You see Cisco and other companies starting to get into it, and as they get into it more and more, there will obviously be security protocols that take care of uh, that specific issue of how much overhead does it have, how do I get the data out, and how do I communicate two-way back but still have the security necessary that I'm not uh, exposing the network and, and the, the applications overall. And so you really have to look at how you pull it together to do that. That's a key part. I'd say overall, though, what the company has figured out to do, as this graph shows, is get about three orders of magnitude better on the power management of that wake up and shut down and standby that other companies have. Yeah, on the very slide, when you actually showed the uh, application programming, software programming. Uh, so there's, uh, there's only about 80 kilobyte of uh, application in there. Um, what sort of application do you expect people to write for this uh, in data constraint memory? Uh, did you have examples of things that the people or you have written for for typical applications that can fit there? And, and also, well, what are the environment with which the developers can write code for this? Uh, again, yeah, most of it is uh, the application. We, we absolutely talk to a lot of customers about what's the application and what do they need. I mean, we just didn't take a punt on 80. Uh, and most of it is, I think, just packaging up of the data and then sending it off. 
And so the applications are very small. There's some that have algorithms on it, some that have, you know, it's the packaging up into an EDI format or XML or some other type and then sending it off. So it's mostly very simple types of applications because that's what you're wanting to do. Uh, you're not trying to put all the, the intel for low power, the intelligence is going to be in the infrastructure. It will not be in the tag. But the tag has to be intelligent enough to be able to be program, field programmable, and to be able to provide that type of calculations that might be local. So it's a real mix we're seeing of how much is in the infrastructure versus how much is in the tag. But most people are moving towards the infrastructure has got the intelligence. So this tag is just basically okay, let me be a very smart way of communicating with you. And there is some intelligence in the tag, i.e., I want to set trip points for monitoring, right, more exception management. It's not I want a data stream going. I want to put enough intelligence in this device that it know, I can trust it to monitor, and only when it trips do I get the information. So we designed it for exception management rather than uh, constant management. To speak more about the kind of application, if you, if you sorry, I'm just going to just finish this question and we'll, we'll go there. To speak more about the kind of application, um, you know, if you think about tracking people within a facility or tracking goods within a facility, like high, you know, like high value drugs, you're trying to monitor the temperature and then actually record the point at which they're used. The let's think about tracking firstly. Um, there are, you know, Cisco has a protocols around where if the, you send just a couple of simple packets like probe requests, that kind of complexity packet, to an access point, the access point will measure the RSSI value of that. So with multiple access points, um, you can then get enough information to work out where someone is in a facility. So a typical application might be uh, like every 60 seconds, um, or every 15 seconds when you're moving and every 60 seconds when you're not moving, the tag wakes up, sends out, say, three probe requests on three channels that are used in the network and shuts down. And then once every five minutes, the tag wakes up, takes a measurement, packages it in a very simple way, um, sends it off to the network, and to do that final thing, it's going to have to have authentication and association so maybe it does that on a case-by-case -case basis. So it wakes up, you know, logs onto the network, does the key exchange, etc. Okay, we're on. We can send this data. It's secure. Shut down again. And that's the entire application. So it's a very simple sensing one, but one that's highly valuable. You know, if you've got five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars worth of drugs, they go out of temperature. You don't know. You want to know when they got used, etc. You know, the cancer-type drugs. So that, that's the kind of value proposition we've been looking at. And we see for you know, building temperature monitoring, perfect. Right. Sorry, and you had a question. Yeah, yeah, C is, is uh, the language. Okay. Yep. And when I think that, uh, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Unless you have a uh, set, up, set up sensors set up for particular application, you may want to make it very configurable such that uh, you can actually upload new modules or new logic so that uh, the same the same infrastructure, the same nodes in the infrastructure can be used for multiple things depending on the uh, application, which depends on customer requirement. If for example, the trigger logic could be programmable in the sense that, that some apps might require triggers at a different special than, say, others. So, so, so how, how do I achieve how do this kind of runtime dynamic uh, configuration and maybe even actually through the air uploading patches and, uh, or for security patches? This yeah. is absolutely being considered in this architecture because we knew of one of um, the companies we're working with did a complete rollout of tags, active tags, through a deployment and then discovered that there was a bug in the code and they had to go around and find every tag, pull it back, connect it up to something and, uh, and reprogram it. Complete cow of a task. <laughs> um, so basically what we've got within the buried deep in, in here is the code so that the 
because the tag is capable of, of authenticating onto a network, onto a secure network. It's capable of downloading code um, from, the, from the network and rewriting into the flash memory um, a complete new application, checking that that application is good, and then at a, um, there's even a mechanism in there so that if you want all the tags in a facility to do an update at the same time, then it actually timestamps the different uh, applications and swaps over when the clock goes to a certain point. You know, we've got TCP/IP there. In fact, um, more importantly than TCP/IP for this is um, protocol. Pardon? Protocol? Yeah. Um, mental block. Um, it, no, anyway, the sorry. The important part is, is but that it's it, being considered within the architecture completely. It is programmable, and even those trip points are programmable. Yeah. Uh, that's where the NVM memory that Jason talked about on chip stores various levels that you can use as trip points. You see, it checks this application. But how, how good is that checking? Because it's an obvious weakness that bad guys try to take over your system. Okay. Is it as strong as VSS? Uh, I think I'd have to mumble extremely loudly. So, um, <laughs> from off the top of my head, I I think I think the guys are um, doing uh, using MD5, but there's no reason why you wouldn't yeah. use uh, an AES, um, you know, you check. MD5 and is there a signature mechanism? Because yeah. somehow you have to trace it back. Sure. To sure. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, in the. I think in the current architecture, what, what you do is append an MD5 sum to the to the app, or the, there's an MD5 sum in the image, which and then when you read it, you do an MD5. I believe, but it's a great way to stop uh, to stop honest people making mistakes. Sure. I'm thinking of this honest people not making mistakes, sure. but trying to take you over. Yeah. If you sign the MD5 yep. by some signature mechanism, and it, you you just yeah. have MD5 with no signature. I think the bad guy can take you over. Yeah, yeah. No, we've, we've considered really heavily, you know, security uh, yeah. and these kinds of problems. And I mean, that's, I guess, illustrated by the fact that we've got five crypto, you know, blocks in, in the mm -hmm. built end of the chip. Uh, you know, we and just can't yeah. answer your question. We just, we yeah. just don't have We're our security. We're not the experts on, on the security, security and software yet. So we, we could get back to you on that. Yeah. We don't know the answer. Yeah. Always block other than this threshold-based wake-up. Do you do timer-based wake-up as sure. well? Sure. Yes, absolutely. But three timers built in there. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, you have this SPI bus yes. side. Yep. Uh, is it just to connect the flash memory, or can I say have another processor that feeds data in and use this as maybe a 802.11 controller chip? The, 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 the catch there is you, you can connect further SPI devices on there. Mm -hmm. Caveat that this device is always the master. Okay. So if you want to do applications that, um, you know, if you actually want to make this a slave, then probably the way to do it is to use the uh, GPIO, GPIO yeah. and then bit bash the pins. One of the things we did, I think, towards that end is consider many applications and like. One of the classic to start with was looking at adding GPS with Wi-Fi to do indoor, outdoor, locate. What we found is most, when you really get down to the nuts and bolts, most people didn't really need outdoor. They need point to point, and they want you to monitor continuously between point, but did they need it in between? If they do, they want GPRS. That's a whole different game. Uh, but we are able to connect to a GPRS, so if you want to do that or you want to a GPS chipset, you can plug those on, and you have a larger tag, more costly, consumes more, but you could build it. Any other questions? Great. So you say that um, your ECOS uh, operating system is multi-traded? Yes. So I was wondering uh, how does the, uh, from the programmer perspective, uh, how does the API look uh, if I want to make uh, um, some CPU intensive operation, like for example, Bank was mentioning like FFTs or that kind of data? Because I imagine that even in a simple application, if you have to acquire lots of data, maybe not just there for sure, but something more complex, mm -hmm. then there is a trade-off about what you can pre-process 
on the tag and uh, what you will transmit or the everlink. Uh, yep. So I mean, uh, either you spend uh, more time here or you spend yep. more time there. So maybe you want to do some port processing. And if I want to do some port processing, which is not uh, shallow, which has some, you know, some substance to it, uh, how does the programmer's API look? What, what kind of services can I leverage to make my life simple? And uh, how do I, from the, in the application, how do I uh, say to the processor, uh, okay, I'm finished, go to sleep, uh, or wake up uh, in five milliseconds and do this other calculation? So that kind of stuff is an API around you just you're calling functions, you know, power down and you give it a time, or power down now, or a, so the complete API kind of wrapped around. Um, uh, you know, shutting down and, and kind of waking up, I guess. Um, yeah, you're right, it's going to be a trade-off with how much processing you do on the tag and how much you kind of, um, how much data you push, push out um, back to the network or back to, uh, you know, an application sitting on the, net, off the network. Um, I, I, I think we, you know, we actually haven't explored this much, yeah. this kind of problem, because we've, you know, Everything we've done to date, I mean, the, the thought of running our tag off a powered source is, or our chip rather, is something that we just haven't actually, which is the, you know, if you're actually in that kind of situation, that's what you're going to be talking, I would have thought, because a battery is not going to hold it up long. We have put very little time into that at all. In fact, none. Yeah. So, okay. Sounding like that, that could be something that's worth following up, right? Following yeah. up. Yeah. I was also thinking about the scenarios like, for example, on the left side, we have the, the, triggering, the triggering sensors that wake up the CPU. So basically, they are, I mean, I suppose that you could see them at a higher level, like uh, tasks that would go off uh, of, of, of timers at some time. And uh, since uh, you have a multi treated OS, uh, that could possibly conflict. Um. Okay. Does the application programmer needs to think about the synchronization timing-wise? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is no facility, automatic facility in no. the system to have a high-level scanning. No, no. I, I believe that that's that's something that you know you would have to specifically sit down and think about and think everything about that's happening line. and really kind of map out the application. Yeah. yeah I mean, the situation of dropping it. You know, if you think about the shock sensors, right? Um, the the situation of dropping a tag while it's transmitting is something that I'm actually, you know, I'm not sure what happens. But usually, that would be a comparatively rare event. Uh, and so, if you did didn't quite get it well, right, then maybe. Okay, so the it's event event queue driven. So events are generated and kind of put in a queue, um, and then exactly how that's kind of uh, how the queue service in a multi-threaded application is something that you know I don't understand because that's not an area of the chip that I've worked particularly on. But, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely thought about that, you know. And I could get you further details if, if that was um, something that we need to follow up. Thank you. Well, I think that concludes our uh, presentation. If, uh, I'm happy to stick around and give you more. Uh, overview if you have specific questions, uh, but uh, very much appreciate you coming in, asking questions, and taking yeah. an interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Yeah.